in 1904, there was a group of annual conventions started in a place called Sialkot, which is the northeast part of Pakistan. And these meetings started a movement where thousands of lives were touched and transformed. Listen to what Smithers says. The victory of the Sialkot meetings was not won in the pulpit, but in the closet. Often the glory rested on these meetings in a mighty way, while hidden out of sight, John Hyde, the faithful few, travailed in prayer. A man named Praying Hyde hid himself away, asking God to do a movement in him so that later God would do a movement in others. And God gave him a hard assignment. He was in the Punjab district of India most of his ministry. I mention this because it, it says that the victory was not won in pulpits, it was won in the closet. I'll go ahead and tell you it doesn't matter what preacher stands behind this pulpit. None of us are clever enough, smart enough, or good enough at speech to see people come to know Christ in our own efforts. It happens when God does a supernatural work inside of people so that only he can get the glory. And that starts when we hide ourselves in prayer closets. I'll go ahead and let you know that if you are in here today and you have never given your life to Jesus Christ, my guess is you're on someone's hit list in here. There's someone who longs to see you come to know Christ because you are making a royal mess of your life. You've tried it in your own strength. You're doing your own thing. And I'm not talking about just people with really bad past. I'm talking about anybody that's lost, whether or not you've been in church your whole life. If you didn't make it to one of our hit lists in prayer, I know you're on Jesus's. Because he records it in his book of John. You're on his hit list. And I want you to know that it's not that we want God to ambush you and wreck your life. What we want him to do is to come and steamroll you in grace. Your life will be destroyed, but it will be destroyed only so that it can be built the right way. And that's in a relationship with God who loves you. As a church, I think it is our call to be the, 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 the praying hide. I also think that we need to pray the right way so that our Heavenly Father will answer. Keep in mind, he says, if we pray according to his name, he'll answer us. And whenever it says in his name, that means in his power and authority. And I assure you, if we pray the things he wants us to pray, he's going to answer. Because he's, he's getting us to a point where he says, finally, you're asking for stuff I've wanted you to ask for. And so that's what we're doing these few weeks. We're going through a, a whole list of, of things that Scripture says that, that we need to have at the forefront of our minds and our hearts concerning the lost. And so today we're going to look at, at three more texts of Scripture and just ask God to shape our prayer life this week based on these texts. But let's, let's just ask God to do a work even now as we listen. Father, I know full well 
that you've been looking forward to today more than we have. I don't understand why you love us the way you do. You know us. You know all of our mess-ups and sins. And for some reason, you love us. And from the time when you sought out Adam and Eve in the garden after they had sinned all the way through the book of Revelation where you gather us and you, you give us a new home. Your word talks about how you long to be with us, your creation. I don't understand. I pray that you would give us that same kind of longing to be with you that nothing else will satisfy us until we we just get to spend time with you. Father, I know that in this room this morning, there's probably people that don't know you as their Lord and Savior. I'm asking today that as they sit here, your spirit would pursue them on a hot and passionate path and that they would see their need for Jesus Christ as only you can make known to them. I also pray, Lord, that you would teach us as a church how to pray. I think we've for a long time prayed passionately but maybe not in all the ways that you want us to. So please, teach us today. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to invite you to turn in your Bibles first to Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel chapter 33, we're going to look at ways to pray evangelistically. Specifically, what do we say in our prayers? We, we started this last week, but, but what do we say in our prayers when we sit down with the Lord? Tomorrow morning, we open our Bibles, we're, we're reading His Word, and then we're praying, and we have those names that, that we're really wanting the Lord to change their life. What do we say in these prayers? Well, one thing that I think we can say is please Make me a watchman for the people around me. That's in your outline. Please make me a watchman for the people around me. I want to read Ezekiel 33 verses 1 through 7. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, speak to the sons of your people and say to them, If I bring a sword upon a land... And the people of the land take one man from among them and make him their watchman. And he sees the sword coming upon the land and blows on the trumpet and warns the people. Then he who hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, and the sword comes and takes him away, his blood will be on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not take warning. His blood will be on himself. But, he had taken, but if he had taken warning, he would have uh, delivered his life. But the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet, and the people are not warned. A sword comes and takes a person from them. He's taken away in his iniquity. But his blood I will require from the watchman's hand. Now as for you, son of man... I have appointed you a watchman for the house of Israel so that you will hear a message from my mouth and give them warning from me. This whole picture of a watchman is powerful if you've ever been one. My second trip to Africa, I went to Mozambique. Now understand this, please. If you ever go to Africa, everything in Africa is, is like concentrate. If you're happy, there's no happy like Africa happy. 
If you're scared, there's no scared like Africa scared. I mean, it's, it's, everything is, is just concentrated. We get to Mozambique, and we find out that there had been like this 20-year war in Mozambique several years before we got there, and everybody was extremely poor. There's poor, and then there's Mozambique poor. They had nothing. And this civil war was one of those things that that decimated the country. And one of the ways they did it was they put landmines everywhere. So when we went, they told us, if you're walking with your translator to the next little village, make sure you always stay on the path. If you've got to use the bathroom, ask people to leave, you do it on the path. Because there's landmines all over this country. So we get there, and we're now a little shaken up. Um, and we, we set up camp right beside the police station. Figure that's the safest place you could possibly be is next to the police station. Well, that night when we went to bed, th- the villagers started cutting our water hose that fed our shower system. So we got up to take showers the next day, and our water hose was this short. They didn't have any hose, so they didn't figure we would notice that it was cut this short. But we noticed. Well, same thing happened the next day. They stole something else, so they finally move us out of town. Now, in order to move out of town, the pastor gathered his church, and it would be as though I came to all of the men in this church, and I said, men, after the service, I need us to gather around the flagpole for a minute. The pastor gathered the men of his church. They all took knives and they went on their hands and knees and and checked for landmines where we were going to put up our camp. He was willing to let his own church be blown up to make sure that we had a safe place to camp. That night they tell us because we've had problems with theft, we're going to start a rotation of watchmen. I'm thinking, oh great. For the rest of the trip, everybody took two hours in the middle of the night. So one person would be awake an hour before I get up, then I come and spend the next hour with them, and then I've spent my two hours, and then somebody else, so it was a rotation. And again, let me tell you, there is no kind of scared like Africa scared. At three in the morning, when it is pitch dark and you can't see your hand in front of your face, every noise is loud. I tell you this because that's where I learned what a watchman is. And when I read this text, there are several things that just jump off of the page. Look at verse 3. Here's, here's what I need to be praying as a watchman. It says, and he sees the sword coming. First and foremost, a watchman has to see trouble coming. If you don't see trouble coming... There's no point in you being a watchman. Let me say that again. If we're going to share Christ with people, they have to understand what the danger is if they don't take note. They need to hear very clearly there is a day coming and judgment will be upon us and we have to give an account for what we've done. Every sin you and I have committed will be brought before the Lord apart from Christ. There's a day coming. The Old Testament calls it the Day of the Lord, capital D. Some of you are intrigued with the book of Revelation and you like reading it. We'll just skip to the end where it says, one day everybody's going to stand before him. Two different judgments, but everyone's going to come before him. I'm telling you this, we've got to see trouble coming. And if we don't see where someone's life is headed without Christ, 
There's no need in me and you being a watchman. But the next thing that we're supposed to do is also in verse 3. It says he blows on the trumpet. You and I uh, are a watchman. We need to get people's attention. We need to get people's attention. You and I, as watchmen, are by nature interrupters. We have to interrupt someone's day. Imagine with me back in Mozambique, if I had have seen a couple of beady little eyes pop up in the dark, it was my job to alert the entire camp that troubles here. I, I, I may could have said, yeah, but they're sleeping so well, I don't want to disturb people. Let me tell you something, if trouble's in front of you, you really do want to be disturbed so that you know the truth. We've got to get people's attention. And then the next thing in verse 3, it says, you have to warn the people. He warns the people. A watchman warns the people. Now, he, here's what I like about this word. It, it's more than just getting people's attention. The word for warn means to illuminate through instruction. It means you do this by teaching. Do you know that if you're going to be a watchman, you and I have to be teachers? It's not enough to go up and say, hey, let me tell you something, you need Jesus Christ. And just leave it there. There's other steps to follow if you're going to be a watchman, and that's to say, hey, not only is there trouble coming, here's what it looks like. Here's what's going on. Here's how we can protect ourselves. There's got to be an element of teaching. Now, I, I, I want to share with you a story that happened this week. This guy tried to be a watchman, and I really kind of didn't let him. I was running one day this week, and, and I'm doing my very best to get in shape. And it, it, trust me, when you're this big and something gets moving, you don't want to stop because it's hard to get it moving again. And, and, and so I'm running through the, the neighborhood and I come across this lawn service truck. My first thought was, these crazy folks are out here mowing in the rain. And then it dawned on me, I'm out here running in the rain. But they're out here mowing in the rain. And, and I, I, I get to the front of the truck, and, and then I'm jogging at the back of the truck. Now keep in mind, I don't stop at all. When I get to the back of the truck, I notice one of the guys beside the trailer who's doing the lawn cutting. And I thought he looked familiar, and he said, hey, are you the guy that was running at the track two Saturdays ago? And I said, yeah, that was me. And then it dawned on me who he was. He was the guy walking around the track. He said, hey, you're doing a great job. I said, thanks. Now, by this point, I'm already past him, holding a conversation, looking back, hoping that he understands. I'm not stopping to talk. And by the time I'm at least from this side of the room to that side of the room, and I've already turned and, and headed down the street, he yells at the top of his lungs, Hey, if I don't see you again, remember, Jesus loves you! He had this long in my life. And as a watchman, what was on his mind was to make sure that I knew that Jesus loves me. I, I wondered the rest of my jog Am I really a watchman? If I've got this long in someone's life, 
is Jesus what I really talk about? Or do I find almost anything else but Jesus to talk about? He showed me what a watchman looks like. which has changed my prayers this week. Lord, help me to look like whatever his name is. The next thing that I believe we can pray for is found in 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 9. Second Kings 7, 9, I'm gonna... Begin in verse 3, but please understand, this in and of itself is not an evangelistic text. However, the lessons that are found in this are a wallop. Now there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate, and they said to one another, Why do we sit here until we die? If we say we'll enter the city, then the famine is in the city and we'll die there. And if we sit here, we'll die also. Now therefore come and let us go over to the camp of the Arameans. If they spare us, we'll live. And if they kill us, we'll but die. They arose at twilight to go to the camp of the Arameans. And when they came to the outskirts of the camp, Arameans, behold, there was no one there. For the Lord had caused the army of the Arameans to hear a sound of chariots and a sound of horses, even the sound of a great army, so that they said to one another, Behold, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Therefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents, their horses and their donkeys, even the camp just as it was, and fled for their life. And when these lepers came to the outskirts of the camp, they entered one tent and ate and drank and carried from their silver and gold and clothes and went and hid them. And they returned and entered another tent and carried from there also and went and hid them. Then they said to one another, we're not doing right. This is a day of good news, but we're keeping silent we wait until morning light, punishment will overtake us. Now therefore come, let us go and tell the king's household. One of the prayers I've been praying this week is, is God help me not to keep the good news to myself. Help me not keep the good news to myself. Just a couple of quick things to point out here. First and foremost, if I'm going to not keep this good news to myself, I I need to remember who I am. In this story, these guys were lepers. There was no reason society should have ever blessed them with anything. They were cursed people. Guys, do you realize in my flesh that is me? One of the things that I have heard at the jail over the past few weeks, and it does break my heart, when asking some of the inmates, what has kept them out of church? I just want to know. There are a lot of good reasons. The number one answer for why they never came to church is because they said, Church folks think they're better than us. I don't know if that's just a perception they have or if they've actually been treated that way. Let me tell you something. In this room, we're all thugs. Just some of us hadn't got caught. We're all lepers in desperate need of grace. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
There is no one righteous, no, not one. We've got to keep that in mind, but the next thing that we have to keep in mind if we're going to not keep the good news to ourselves is, is we have to appreciate what we have. Because do you realize these guys walked in and they're just, they're used to begging for scraps and they walk in and they now have clothes and food and drink and I'm guessing horses and donkeys and whatever else they wanted. Because of God's grace... You and I, in our condition, have walked into more blessings than we know how to count. We sit in this room this morning, and we are overly blessed by what God has done for us. We don't deserve this kind of goodness. The fact that you went to Sunday school and you opened a copy of God's Word and you had the chance to study it, and then you come in here with other brothers and sisters... Get, this doesn't happen everywhere. We are so blessed. But the other part of this is to realize that there's going to be consequences if we are selfish. Verse 9, punishment will overtake us. If they don't share, punishment will overtake them. I'm going to tell you this now, church family. God expects his his blessings to be invested, not just spent. We have the good news of Jesus and he does not want us to sit on that blessing and just enjoy it ourselves. He wants that message to be invested into other people. And so one of the things that you and I need to pray each morning is God help me not to keep this good news to myself. Please help me find someone else that I can give this stuff to. And then there's one other text that I want us to look at this morning. That's in Luke 14. I wish so bad that we could take this whole parable apart and it's just good stuff. I'm going to begin in verse 16. Luke 14, verse 16. But he said to him, a man was giving a big dinner and he invited many. At the dinner hour, he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, come for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I have bought a piece of land and I need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I have married a wife and for that reason I cannot come. And the slave came back and reported this to his master. Then the head of the household became angry and said to his slave, Go out at once into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and crippled and blind and the lame. Go find the rest of the folks that nobody else wants, basically. And the slave said, Master, what you commanded has been done and still there is room. And the master said to the slave, Go out into the highways and along the hedges and compel them to come in so that my house may be filled. Stop right there. I need to pray, God, give me the urgency to compel people to come into the banquet. Give me the urgency. This whole, this whole, time I've ever been taught evangelistic strategies, it, it looks a whole lot like this. Hey, can I ask you a question? Do you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? If you don't, oh, well, it's obvious that you really don't want Jesus. So, hey, I appreciate you giving me a few minutes of your time. We'll go to the next person. 
This particular parable stopped me because of the word compel. I'm not saying be mean and beat people up, but the word compel means do so with a sense of urgency, which is forceful, making and necessitating. It's basically this. If I'm going to compel you to come to my house, to the banquet, I'm saying, listen, you've got to come today. There's not an option. You must come with me. The old life that you've been living, you've got to leave it. You have to. Get out of that old life. You can say that lovingly, but I want to show you a picture of what it looks like to compel. If we'll show that video, please. And we have now some incredible footage out of Houston from our affiliate KHOU that shows crews rescuing a semi driver out of the cab of his truck stuck in floodwaters. Let's take a look at that. With the Harris County Sheriff's Office now approaching the semi that has been stalled here. Uh, headed east or headed westbound in the eastbound lanes. They're trying to navigate, like I said, a very narrow channel here to get to the window of the cab so that they can get to the driver who is inside. Uh, I don't have any word on, on how long he's been there um, or what kind of condition he's in. I'm sure he's very, very wet, very cold, very frightened. Um, I can't, I am terrified for him, so I can't imagine uh, the level of fear he has here, but these uh, kudos, incredible kudos to these two sheriff's deputies who are risking themselves on this boat in very deep water to pull this driver to safety. We want to thank all first responders who are out there, who are doing the same, who are risking their lives. Um, these, these deputies, they weren't on their way here. Um, Thank goodness they were in the right place at the right time. I saw them coming on Beltway 8. I flagged them down, told them about the situation, and now they are here saving this man's life. Uh, you see him throwing some of his stuff to them. Anything dry, anything dry. I'm sure there's not a lot dry left in that cab. And here he comes. I feel like I can finally breathe. Kind of a sigh of relief. That he is okay. And his fate will not be the same as the man who lost his life here a year ago in almost the same situation. Semi-driver going into high water, not knowing how, just how deep it can get in this area. And who's to say if rescue crews weren't here, if these guys didn't stop, that his story would be different. So thank you to everyone out there, all police, all fire, all sheriff's deputies, any other agencies who are out there, neighbors who are taking in neighbors, who are helping folks who get stranded. Thank you. We're gonna see if we might be able to talk to him as they make their way uh, back down here. Uh, I imagine he is going through a cycle of emotions right now. Uh, it has become. They got him. Sir, thank God you're okay. Yes, How does it feel to be on land? Wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> yeah. What went through your mind when you saw that water? Lord help me. Lord help me. Lord help me. Just get me out of here safe. I'm yeah. so glad these guys were on hand that we were able to direct them to you. No doubt. No um, doubt. 
did they tell you this is the same spot a year ago where another driver died? Most definitely, most definitely, said most definitely. Now you thank God that you guys was right here to get me, put me back on land safe. I appreciate you. Can I? This is gonna sound weird, but can I hug you? I am so happy you're okay. Thank, thank you, you so much. Stay, stay safe. Stay dry. Uh, the That's best okay. possible outcome there. All right. So uh, I was just saying I have to give a little That's bit good. of context here. Same spot last year, somebody died. Almost the same situation. But this year, someone was there with a boat. And I'm guessing those sheriffs didn't come up and say, hey, do you want to ride? They probably said, give me your stuff and get in. And they took off. And that guy's going back to his family. I say that because there's a lot of people in our town, in your family that you work with, that so far have had no boat pull up beside them and say, get in. And they need someone who is praying urgently, God, please compel me to go talk to them to come to safety. God, we come to you right now and I thank you so much for the pictures that you've given us, the examples of what it means to cry out to people to come and be a part of your kingdom. I thank you for sending that man in my life this week who cared enough about me to tell me that Jesus loves me. I thank you for showing me what a watchman looks like. God, it's my prayer that as a church, we would understand that, that in, this, in this county and in this town, the situation is just as bleak as it is in Houston. Folks are dying without you. We may not be underwater, but there's a ton of other sins that have swallowed us up, and we are in desperate need of a Savior. And you've called us as a church to be the ones who take that message of rescue to them. Please, shape our hearts so that we pray the right way and then when we get up off of our knees, we begin to act the right way because this is a matter of life and death. I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.